It's been around three years since I uploaded a video on this channel. That's a long time. Basically what happened is after the last video, uh, I got really excited and I really wanted to start like making videos on the regular. Um, and then I got really depressed for no reason, and then there was a worldwide pandemic. And then I got really depressed. Uh, and then I sat on a cold rock in the woods for around 14 months. And here we are. You're all caught up. So. To my friends, supporters, patrons, and subscribers, I give you the gift of me talking about a cartoon you've never heard of for almost an hour. Well, here you go. The Venture Brothers is an animated comedy action series that ran on Adult Swim from 2004 to 2018. The show acts as a parody of the old-school serialized sci-fi action adventure and mystery stories you once found in comics, novels, films, and on TV. Such as The Hardy Boys, Doc Savage, The Fantastic Four, Tom Swift Jr., and of course Johnny Quest. The show focuses on washed-up super scientist and former boy adventurer Dr. Thaddeus Rusty Venture, living in the shadow of his vastly more successful, heroic, and masculine scientist father. Resentful and traumatized, but still carrying on the family traditions of super science, going on globetrotting adventures, and regularly dealing with supervillains. Most prominently, his butterfly-themed megalomaniac nemesis the Monarch, and dragging around his overqualified bodyguard Brock and the next generation of traumatized boy adventurers. His two oblivious sons, Hank and Dean, the Venture Brothers. Okay, that's a synopsis, certainly. That's what the show is about. But that's not what The Venture Brothers is, exactly. The Venture Brothers is a fucking world, man. This series is an unfurling web of narratives and characters that gets bigger and richer one way or another with every passing episode. So maybe I should lead with this. The Venture Brothers is my favorite television show. Probably ever. I've seen the whole thing through well over a dozen times, and it has yet to get old. To me, this show was a gift. It always felt like something that was too good for network television, and in the end, I guess it was. It was cancelled last year after its last episode aired in 2018. There is, thankfully, a movie on the way that will properly wrap up the events of the series, but it still hurts to have the plug pulled like that. There's no more weekly t-shirt club, there's no more tune in next week ventures for Escape to the House of Mummies Part 3. The serialized adventure format was part of the soul and part of the joke, and it's just over now. Which stinks. But it's okay, too. I wouldn't be a fan of this show if I couldn't appreciate things that end abruptly, awkwardly, and sometimes painfully. Since this came in the heels of former head of Adult Swim Mike Lazo's retirement from the company, fans have hypothesized that he was more or less the main force keeping the show on the air. There are certainly a number of other factors in the mix, but whether or not it's true, it's a romantic thought that the series was kept in production by a single lone appreciator. It's fitting, in a way, because that's who you do it for, isn't it? The one guy who gets the joke. Hi, I'm Steak. Don't come any further, you're in the germ-free zone! Oh, pull yourself together! Hey! I spent the past year and a half trapped in a box, box, box. It's been a lot longer than that. Woo! Let's make some magic. Much like the series itself, this video initially claims to be about failure, and it will be, but it'll be about a whole bunch of other things too. Sorry, you gotta title these things somehow. If SEO would let me get away with calling it Shadow Man 9 in the Cradle of Destiny, I wouldn't have given it a second thought. This video can end spoilers for the entirety of the Venture Brothers. If it looks interesting to you, give it your time. In terms of sensitive content, fair warning, it's a cartoon that ran on Adult Swim since the early 2000s. The show has a good heart, but you know, it was the 2000s. You get what you'd expect. I think you'll be fine. If not, that's fine too. Also, season one is a bit of a rock start, but it picks up fast, and it might just be worth your time. If you don't, I guess you're just here to hear me talk, which is fine too. I miss you too, Stretch. Not in the parasocial way though, fuck off. Let's cuddle. Before I get too deep into things here, I want to rep some better shit than this. Channel Super Swim Team 7 made a couple great vids about the series and then graciously compiled most of the other analysis videos on the topic into a playlist, on which are two of my personal favorite creators on the platform, B Mask and Strucci Movies. B Mask also made a killer Fantastic Four video that, for me, helped sequence a bit more of the genome of this series, since counterintuitively, I'm not personally much of a superhero comics guy myself. This is crap. Trying not to use the word cape shit anymore, because last time I did an angel died. I've watched all the videos here. All great. Big thumbs up. Check them out. Ring that bell. Don't ring mine, though. It's, uh, poison. 
<laughs> the Venture Brothers is the brainchild of series creator Christopher McCulloch, aka Jackson Public, and his co-writer Doc Hammer. I don't like to say brainchild, partially because it sounds foul, and partially because film and animation are a collaborative effort. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And I want to give my respect to how much talent goes into the show's production. While these two do many of the voices, the actors they pull in go a long way. Every guest does a great job and adds their own flavor, and there is no Doc Brock or Dean without James Urbaniak, Patrick Warburton, or Michael Sinter Nicholas. There just isn't. Doc Hammer is a musician and has written tracks for the series, but the vast majority majority of the show's music, including the signature opening and end credits, is done by J.G. Thurwell. It's great stuff, suits the whole production flawlessly. And visually, the show is a treat to behold. It's not always perfect, it's outsourced animation for network television after all, but it's impressively put together. They bring on killer animators, strong background and storyboard artists, fresh talent and comic book veterans who can really sell the world behind these words. The painted backgrounds are gorgeous and varied. Every location has its own mood and they match some ambitious storyboards. There's action and camera angles, there's day and night, and the animation is no less impressive. These are detailed and natural character designs, communicating who these people are, what their role is, and just about a million tiny references. The hands look like hands, there are body types and facial structures, beauty, ugliness, youth, age, and deformity. These are things you can't always count on in animation, especially on a budget. That being said, when it comes to the story and characters, who they are, who they'll become, and where they're going, it's nothing but Doc and Jackson. These are two brilliant guys who form like Voltron into one super genius. They each have their own strengths as writers. Jackson tends to lean a little harder on the format and grand plot lines, moving things forward with action and intrigue, where Doc will have the characters sit in a room and really talk for a while, getting into their history a bit. Not to say they both can't do both of those things very well, it's just sort of where they're writing trends. But what has really allowed the series to blossom and grow is from the conversation between them. They hone in on the specific kind of jokes and references you hone in on when you're talking with someone who's on exactly the same frequency as you. The kind of particular voices or outfits you saw in movies no one cares about, but that's somehow individually stuck in both of your craws, so you know they must be important somehow. That's the kind of nerdiness the Venture Brothers can really get to the heart of. Together they push each other to run with ideas you'd think were too stupid to run with if they only existed in your own head until they become brilliant. The series has an incredibly elaborate and impressive continuity, and I'm sure that this or that was planned out from the beginning, but I can totally buy that so much of this was made up on the fly and it all just happened to fit together perfectly. That's just what happens when people are in sync. Jackson has directed nearly every episode of the series, effectively all of them up until the last season when Juno Lee stepped in with Jackson supervising. Barring a technicality, since career and science as a Doc Hammer joint, every episode in the series save one was being written by one or both of them. That one episode was written by Ben Edlund, creator of The Tick, and Jackson Public actually worked as a storyboard artist and writer on both the original live action and animated The Tick series before The Venture Brothers. I believe in you. If you're a fan of The Tick, that might give you an idea of where the series spirit comes from as a superhero parody, but even that doesn't really capture where the show's heart is at. Public goes into this in Go Team Venture, the art and making of The Venture Brothers. As an aside, I got this book for like 25 bucks and it's fucking incredible. There's so much art in here and they go through almost every episode of the show in detail. With Ken Plume logging Doc and Jackson going into everything I've ever wondered about. Every joke, premise, and reference. Where ideas got out of hand and when they decided to run with them anyway because it'd just be funny. Well worth nabbing if you're a fan of the show. Anyway, Jackson goes into how the impetus for the show really came from an old Tom Swift Jr. novel and the realization of how much Johnny Quest had aped it. Tom Swift was published by the Stratemeyer Syndicate alongside Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, so you can see how a lot of these things started getting mashed up and where the jokes started coming from. That sort of Leave it to Beaver style 50s wholesomeness run up against a more cynical, modern view of the past. And of course, what would be the reality of the adventures they go on. The show has never really been about the titular Venture Brothers, but it's not hard to see how they're the well everything sprung from. They, and so many other comedy duos on the show, are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, functionally indistinguishable as personalities and on a wavelength they only share with each other. The confused and unwitting observers of a story happening around them, blindly walking into their own demise. When you write a comedy, you have to start with the joke, and Hank and Dean, at least initially, are the joke. They're the comical idea of a glassy-eyed goovis and gallant saying golly gee as they watch a man bleed out in front of them. To quote the book, Everything is a little sad. I was younger, so I had an actively darker, subversive sense of humor. That's how you make comedy when you're younger. You make everything suck and you make everything get chaotic and nasty and subversive. Not that I still don't love that kind of stuff. Now I just think about the characters. The route to writing about failure is more hopeful somehow, and more based in real life. It's not just what's the worst thing I can do to these people. It's what's the embarrassing moment from my life that I can draw from. What's the real thing that happened to me, even if it turns into a version of it that involves lasers and nanobots. It's still, oh yeah, I shit my pants in public. 
Whatever it is, it comes from a more real place. That gets to the root of what does it for me about this show. There's truly nothing new under the sun. We've been subverting and deconstructing for hundreds of years, and the thing about artists is that they always want to make something that's never been made. We've seen Godzilla step on Bambi. What's next? I can't say the bare root of what if comic books but real is brand spanking new. We all have this perfectly generic idea of Superman in our heads, but comics are no stranger to new concepts. Pushing the envelope and really exploring every direction a superhero can go in. And it's not just comics, superheroes have been fucking every for a while now, and even I can tell we're getting more high-profile stuff with an edgier, more biting, and more comedic attitude. Listen up, goons! Excuse me, I identify as a hench? It really all comes down to thesis and tone, and when it does, The Venture Brothers isn't a show about how if Superman was real, wouldn't that be fucked up? It's about how if Superman was real, you'd think he was a fucking dork. For every thousand people calling him an existential threat to humankind, you'd have a thousand more Lex Luthers on Twitter saying, get this ass Boy Scout off my timeline because that's real life too it's not all war and tragedy blood and piss and bad sex that's all in there of course but real life is also pettiness and insecurity it's the boring moments that happen in between joy and catastrophe it's being surrounded by people you love and can't stand at the same time it's weird enemies you don't understand how you made expectations you didn't live up to and trying to figure out if you're grateful or resentful of what you have real life is about failure but you know what they say about failure it's stupid. I mean, it's the best teacher and all that, but also it's just funny. When you fall flat on your face, all you can really do is laugh about it. Oh god, I'm gonna puke all over his crappy childhood memories. So good. You can find something to smile about in something that hurts, and when you learn to do that, you can live honestly. Look at everything horrible about the world head on, tell yourself it's beautiful, and then start to convince yourself that it actually is. Or maybe the beautiful thing is just that you bothered to look in the first place. So that's what I think failure is in this show, or at least what it means to me. The way fucking up everything can just make it better. A little more funny, a little more endearing, and a little more human. So that's our theme here, folded as unceremoniously as possible into every trope and facet of pop culture the show can get a beat on. I hope you can see how a show could really start to grow from that. The idea that The Venture Brothers is a parody of Johnny Quest isn't inaccurate, but it can't really be contained by that label. It's more of a template than a box to be put in. The great thing about Johnny Quest was that it felt like it could take you anywhere and show you anything, and The Venture Brothers feels the same way, just with a different outlook. Take for example Go Team Venture. I don't know, they just do that. The show has had a number of catchphrases catch on, like Spanakopita and Ignore Me, the latter one being one Doc Hammer has been open about hating, or at least hating getting it parroted back to him, and knowing that definitely paid off for me. But the main catchphrase is Go Team Venture. It's one that's clunky and awkward, meant to rip on everything you think it's ripping on. But at a certain point, it just means what it means. It makes you remember everything, it gives you the warm fuzzies. <laughs> it's still a joke, it's still self-aware, but you feel it. That's what the show is, less deconstructive and more reconstructive. Bringing back the magic, but a bit more honest, because you're a grown-up now. The Venture Brothers isn't here to ask what is Johnny Quest, it's here to ask what is Rusty Venture. It's when you f and then you open up your hand inside his No, no, he's laying down. Then whatever you come out with, you rub on his dick. Wrong! The Rusty Venture is a straight move. Alright, I had to get that one out of the way. Stay with me. Dr. Venture, everyone. The man. The myth. The absolute dirtbag. You couldn't ask for a better leading man. By which I mean you couldn't ask for a worse leading man. Unsuccessful, self-obsessed, sick of his life, but still somehow oozing with an incredibly watchable anti-charisma. Rusty is our cautionary tale about the dangers of boy adventuring. He lived the Johnny Quest life without having any say in the matter. Traveling the world, seeing the sights, pulling the trigger. Like the Venture Brothers themselves, Rusty grew up being dragged by his father and batshit nuts friends and allies through a terrifying, violent world with hardly any agency. Something he never really found even after inheriting the Venture fortune. But unlike Hank and Dean, Rusty's father was more successful than you could ever imagine. Jonas Venture Sr. was a manipulative narcissist admired by the world for his scientific accomplishments and hyper-masculine James Bond meets Doc Savage public persona. He's a genuine villain who was able to take everything he ever wanted from the world by seamlessly fitting into the role of everyone's hero. Even without having been suddenly plucked from Rusty's life, he's not a man who would likely ever really be willing to hand the reins over to his son. This feeling manifests as Jonas Jr., an all but totally literal tumor growing in Doc his whole life who, upon his escape, turns out to also be a much more traditionally capable and appropriate heir to the Venture throne. Ah! Can you say so? Doc has spent his entire life being keelhauled through Jonas Sr.'s legacy without ever leaving his shadow. Now he's left pissing away his family fortune, unable to get over himself enough to properly operate as the super scientist he wants to be recognized as, and of course raising two boys as a single father. Well, part of the joke is that the life of a boy adventurer would be traumatic, it's also that in Rusty we see the child actor. When do we get to meet Rusty? I'm Rusty Venture, why can't you kids wrap your heads around that? What happened? 
I left Neverland so I could marry Wendy. What do you think happened? Any good questions? Someone who was once admired for a public persona that didn't really reflect anything about who they really are. Who never got the chance to come into their own, so they slid down into nothing. Can you imagine having the entire world treat you like you never met the standard you set when you were fucking nine years old? Bone chilling. And he's not alone, he's got other broken contemporaries. Victims of the boy adventurer industry, I guess. Like Action Johnny, who may or may not be the actual Johnny, and whose thread in the series finds him slowly pulling out of being a psychotic junkie. You can run, Johnny, but you will never get away! <laughs> right? Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> we did that. Yeah. Or your Hardy Boys slash Menendez brothers. It all just hangs together so nicely. The series' knack for matching up pop culture and reality is exemplified here. There was a real Rusty Venture cartoon, but there was also a real Rusty Venture, and the real Rusty's life was a nightmare. So he has to cling to the only image of himself anyone has ever respected, even though it brought him nothing but stinking thinking and dilly dallying. Rusty is living between the terrifying reality of his childhood and the impossible weight of his celebrity. Doc doesn't even know what really happened to him and what was made up to sell lunchboxes. Did he really ride a Pteranodon? I don't know, probably. You weren't there, fuck you. My father made me kill a man, kill a man with a house key. I was 10. You get to empathize with Doc in spite of what a bastard wretch he is, in part because he's so goddamn impotent. When Jonas Venture manipulates and seduces women, it's completely scummy. When Doc tries to, you just kind of feel bad for him. It's never gonna work, and deep down he knows that. I'm a man. I need to be touched. I don't want to be laughed at, denied, or even feel like the pathetic man I clearly am. Does make some solid points, Brock. I think that's a great example of how failure can improve your view of someone. You get the sense he doesn't even really know why he's doing it. He doesn't know why he's doing anything. But you can also empathize with Rusty because whenever you get the slightest peek behind the curtain, he does genuinely want to be the paragon of progress in super science you'd expect from the Venture name. He's often shown to be right on the edge of villainy himself. The Venture Brothers, like so many richer takes on superhero stories, really likes to play with the concept of identity. It's the idea that good and evil, heroes and villains, are just roles we play. He vows revenge, and then you tell him that good always triumphs over evil. Does it? Of course not. Now get out there and get this crap over with. You're blocking traffic. They aren't something fundamental or innate. They're constructed by the world around us. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say the S word. Yeah, he always said he'd have the last laugh. He was always wrong. Welcome to the end of the Stake Bentley. We live in a society and fiction isn't real jackass trilogy. After this, we're done with self-awareness. We're talking about the anime where the hamster listens to the guy jerk off on the phone. That's a real outsider, alright. In the show, the main villainous organization, the Guild of Calamitous Intent, is really nothing more than a bureaucracy of LARPers, sustaining their violent role-playing through organized crime. These guys like their system. You take that away and you are looking at a bunch of pissed off nutbags with ray guns and giant, I don't know, a giant octopus. Rich and powerful lunatics who built the world around a game they wanted to play. Even before that, they were people who wanted to make the world better. Colonel Lloyd Venture, Rusty's great-great-grandfather, was a part of the guild itself until it splintered off and became what it is. It all comes from the same place. The serpent was already in the Garden of Eden. How perfect can that place be if it can't even keep out a snake who wants to trick you? There's really nothing of substance keeping Rusty on the good guy side. The good guys, the Office of Secret Intelligence, are again a mix and match. They're every shield type secret agent org and also just the US military, the CIA, and the FBI. Another example of people who never grew up. Only these people are running things, playing out their childhood power fantasies. They're barely less insane and bloodthirsty than the bad guys, so what's even the point of being a good guy in the first place? That's the world Rusty is caught between, and you can see how that could force him in some weird directions with this whole super science thing. Whatever moral compass he may have, it's being scrambled and dissolved by an acid magnet. He has a traumatic past and no respect for human life. Not until we ship. He's swimming in money he didn't earn and still feels owed something he doesn't have. He's scientifically literate, but not enough to actually help people. His scientific ventures are never curing disease or feeding people, they're all mad scientist bullshit. Clones and walking eyes and mutated lab techs. Because that's what he grew up around. That's what's cool. In the pilot of the series, he's bringing a disintegration ray to a science conference and saying, What? It's not a weapon, it's just like a... City melting death ray. What's the fucking problem here? For everything telling him he's supposed to be a hero, there's just as much that screams villain because they come from the same place. They're the same person. There's an episode where Killinger, Henry Kissinger, as this all knowing Mary Poppins style supervillain life coach, essentially rolls into Rusty's life, forces him to confront his past, and then presents him with the option to really be a villain. And it's kind of powerful. Doc has the whole thing laid out for him, clear as day. This role is here for you, waiting for you to claim it. You have your nemesis, you have your means, you have the ability and the pain, you can do this and you'd be good at it. 
And Rusty can look at all of that, everything he's been through, and say, yeah, but I don't want to be evil. He thinks I'm a... Brock, am I... a... bad person? The hell just happened? Am I, Brock? That's the great thing about him. Sometimes being disillusioned just means you can see through the whole thing. Sure, the whole super science villain game feels stupid. It's not going anywhere. No one's accomplishing anything. It's all violence and roleplay. But at the end of the day, it's still real, and it still means something to us. Choosing to be a villain means choosing to be a bad guy. It means relinquishing the premise that you could ever do better, ever actually help anyone. And that's not who Rusty is. He's a scumbag, but he's a grown-up. Even in a show with brilliant characters, old pros and actual supermen, Rusty is the adult. And adults don't put on rubber masks and terrorize people just because it's fun. Because that would be fucking silly. Jonah Sr. realized all this too, but to him it was a joke. To him it meant being above everyone. Rusty can't be above everyone, so he has to meet them at eye level. I suddenly get it. Your children. That's why my dad put you in the pool and made you duke it out. Newsflash. My dad was a shitty parent. Part of the bitterness of growing up is realizing that we're all just children who got old. No one really knows what they're doing, and when you come to terms with that, you can either look down on people, or you can show them the respect everyone deserves. How you treat children says a lot about how you treat people, which in turn says a lot about you. He says that he's got a PhD in child psychology, so, you know... Whatever. Jonah Sr. will sit on the sidelines of a soccer game and laugh when the kids start crying and biting each other. Rusty will go out there and say, Stop fucking screaming! You're the ones who wanted to play soccer! You have to follow the rules! This is how you deal with the problem! Those boys are not your problem! Samson, they're my problem! You're both wrong. Those boys are my problem. That's why he's the better father, and it's why he's the better person. He's still bad, but at least he's grounded. At least he's honest and willing to involve himself in the game, even if it doesn't amount to much. The world may be nothing but a broken system, but it's still the world, and you're still a part of it. You can't just opt out, take the good and leave the bad. A fact that turned out to be JJ's fatal undoing. He wasn't willing to play the game. He stepped out of Rusty and into the Venture shoes, but then he tried to be Steve Jobs. He thought that's what being a Venture meant, because he didn't go through what Rusty did. Death rays and villains and what have you. Well, it's an antiquated system. Maybe my brother is good with this nampy pamby guy in a costume chases you around nonsense, but I'm he only saw the good in Jonas Venture Sr., which was wholly superficial, and he wanted to actually be what everyone thought Jonas Sr. was. It's a tragedy because JJ was a genuinely decent person. He believed in the potential of science Rusty does, but he actually seized upon it and made a name for himself, exemplifying how much Rusty squandered what he had without consideration for why he was a squanderer. The show had to be about brothers. It couldn't have just been the Dean Venture show. It's all about two people who come from the same place, made of the same stuff, finding their own identity. Jonas Jr. comes off as almost even more of a smug prick than Jonas Sr., but that's only because he's the real deal. He's just better than you, and that's fucking annoying, but more importantly, it's not something the world of this show is going to reward for too long. This series loves its characters, and it can get a little distracted exploring all of the great ideas you can do with them, and that's amazing. But it's also amazing that it's willing to accept when a character has played their role, and when they become a more valuable player dead than alive. It keeps things real and fresh. The most notable exception of this is probably Baron Underbite. It seems like a great idea, giving Doc his own Doctor Doom, but his joke just never came through. That's it. I will tolerate no more of this madness. He never found his place, and he just sort of got grandfathered out of the story on Gargantua alongside a bunch more interesting characters like Professor Impossible. alongside the characters on the other side of the coin from JJ, like the Sovereign and the Investors. Villains who aimed a little too high and wanted to take the bad without the good. There's a weird sort of karmic balance to all the bullshit. It is you who have forgotten your place. We were never meant to rule over these mortals. They are but fools. This is true. Kept in line by characters like Killinger, the Master, and all the more competent higher-ups and keepers of the bureaucracy, like late-game Dr. Mrs. the Monarch. Even if the show is rooted in failure, somebody has to be keeping the lights on, which raises the question of how do you handle people who know what they're doing in a show like this? More often than not, the answer is simple. You undercut them. You make them a number two or a henchman and explain why they're there in the first place. Brock Sampson, our bodyguard, is a good example of this. The man is a living legend, a superman, a nut dispenser. So there's something not quite right about the fact that he's sitting here taking shit from Rusty Venture of all people. It's way too tight. You look ridiculous. Yeah, you look great. Insults. That's what you called me away from my spring cleaning for? There's reasons. This is his punishment. He's protecting the magical hoo-ha. But really, this is just sort of his role. Brock is a tool of the agency. Just because he's doing cool stuff and looking good doing it doesn't mean he's not taking orders. Carry on, good and evil Superman. 
You work for the government. What about uh, humanity and empathy and all that garbage? Who cares? And you're a tool, boy. A tool! Built for a single purpose by the United States of shut your third damn eye for a fucking reason. You can't teach a hammer to love nails, son. That dog don't hunt! hunt. Brock was practically raised and whipped into tip-top shape by fucking Hunter S. Thompson, or rather Colonel Hunter Gathers of the OSI. He's used to getting reamed by these skinny little pricks, with the ventures that still means indiscriminately killing whoever he has to, that's his job after all. But it also means being the nanny. Brock gets to look a little emasculated watching after the boys and still comes off in a good light because the boys need that figure in their life. It's not like their father is exactly a role model. Rusty is a better dad than Jonas, but by itself that says just about as little a sentence possibly can. He's inattentive, insecure, and either dismisses them entirely or can't stop projecting his own life and expectations onto them. What's so he just lets them fucking die? <laughs> Brock can kind of see how bad Hank and Dean have it, so he gets to step in and be a dad a little bit. It's heartwarming in a fucked up kind of way. He definitely has more of a relationship with Hank, but it's clear he cares for both of them. That said, it seems like he was maybe holding them back a little, considering his skill as a protector. Season 4 brought a lot of changes to the formula, including Hank and Dean really starting to grow up and come into their own as individual characters, which coincided with Brock stepping out of the bodyguard position. He goes on to work with Sphinx, a sort of repurposed Cobra from G.I. Joe organization, with their facilities left over from when the OSI decided to wipe them out once and for all decades ago after they were framed for the supposed death of Jonas Venture Sr. It's a great one season arc where Brock finally gets to play the vigilante a little, working outside the good guy bad guy dichotomy to take down some actual threats for once, alongside Hunter and the other OSI refugees like Sky Pilot and Absolute Icon Shoreleave. The list of amazing threads and characters is, uh, it's long, and I have to choose who's on top, which means I can't go into Shoreleave, and I just want you to know that it stings. Brock leaving meant the bodyguard role had to be filmed by ex-villain Sergeant Hatred. It was just about the sweetest old slab of this and that. Oh, he just wants to hug everybody in the whole damn world. He's nothing but love. Oh, we got tickets to a Broadway show. <laughs> anyway, he's a pedophile. Venture fans have echoed this sentiment, but I would have never, ever, ever have expected to find myself this endeared to a former child molester. That's some vile shit, man. That's never leaving. But if nothing else, Hatred knows that, and he pays for it. On top of hating himself for his disease, he's also a recovering alcoholic. His wife left him, he lost his job, he lost everything. And now here he is, ready to be a goddamn venture. Look, I was in the Guild of Calamitous Intent, and I'm also a recovered pedophile. So if anyone knows the rules about abducting young boys from their bed, it's old Sergeant Hatred. Why did I let you take this job? Because I'm great! Brock will go around the world. Maybe he'll teach an orangutan to box. Maybe. But he's not gonna let you hit him with a faulty shrink ray and make him hide in a ransom bag. Maybe you could go out no. and make some no. dead people. No. Well, fine. Thanks a lot for not helping. Anything else? Help me get dead people! Hatred is up for anything, no matter how stupid, and it gets fucking stupid. Hank, I know where you're going with this, and I love it! Let's cuddle. That's why he's the best. But even so, Brock is a hard act to follow, even if you're not a sex criminal. The boys come to more or less accept Hatred as one of the family as well, but it took some work. Hank especially started to find a bit of a rebellious spirit in rejecting Hatred and emulating Brock in his absence. Again, this is the season where things really started to change, and the brothers finally started to actually grow up. Oh, hell no! Not this crap again! Huh. Granted, this was the season where the whole cloning operation goes up in smoke, which means the boys actually have to age. Have I not mentioned that? That the Venture Brothers are clones? Yeah, Hank and Dean have died. Like, a lot. In keeping with a Johnny Quest but a real-life idea, eventually you have to ask the question of, even with a guy like Brock, how do these two dumb kids survive this kind of crap happening around them every day? And the answer is, they fucking don't, son! If there's one thing I believe the series really wanted to pull off, it was this. It just fits so well and makes perfect sense. That between the dangerous adventures, the serialized format, the legacy of super science, and the disregard for morality and humanity itself, the Venture Brothers keep dying and being brought back to life by their father. It's not like it really matters from our perspective as viewers. Viewers. Hank and Dean die at the end of season one, and then season two, bam! Go Team Venture! Go Team Venture! When Hank and Dean quote unquote come back to life, the show seems to reinforce that it's really all okay. Oh, come on, no, 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 you're Dean. There's no other Dean. You're it, flesh and blood. Look, I was conceived in the backseat of a Packard, you were conceived in a tank, so what? It's not as bad as being dead, it's nothing more than a band-aid for a really big boo-boo. Remake their memories, remake their bodies, and they're back. It's like magic. It's literally practically the same as magic in the logic of the show. So really, it's fine. 
Except it's not fine. A bunch of kids are fucking dead. They are his dead sons, forever haunting his subconscious mind. Deep down, even Rusty understands that. This is morbid. This is what this life looks like. This is what happened to Hank and Dean Venture. And it's part of the legacy too. It's just what this family does. Helper's a family member. And when you lose a family member, what do you do? Cry? No, you rebuild him. That's the Venture way. You've gone too far this time, Jonas. I thought you'd all be pleased. I saved our friend's life. Yeah, but what kind of life is this? As we learned in the last season, all of this is true of Rusty and by extension JJ and probably one other person I'll mention later. It's looking more and more like there are actually three Venture Brothers to a generation. Maybe more, things are uh, getting pretty sticky. For the boys, it's Hank, Dean, and Dermot, Rusty's illegitimate son. Go back outside and ring the doorbell. Which, seriously? Dermot is Hank's best friend, and it's really pretty heartwarming how he fits in. He's a shithead teenager in a way I find really entertaining and true to life, but he's still a good kid, more or less. Uh, Mr. V, I have a full-time job, and I teach ninjutsu classes on the weekends. Technically, he wears that weird padded giant baby suit for a rape prevention class. He gets to play the role of a real person, actual teenager Hank gets to interact with to spur his growth into an actual person as well instead of a cartoon character. For Dean, that person is the perfectly normal teenage daughter of Doctor Strange in practice, is Mr. Rogers in person, Master Necromancer, and fan favorite, Dr. Orpheus. I'm kind of running into the same problem as the show is here, where I love Dr. Oda bits, but I just can't fit him into the script. <laughs> they smell my cat. <laughs> he's adorable, he's wonderful, I love the triad, I love the master, but we got more important things to talk about. Like a uh, shallow gravy. Two, three, four. Dean's growth in particular is more in line with what you'd expect from the guy who comes after Rusty. In Doc Hammer's words, Dean is a fulcrum. Things happen around him. Part of that is the role he's in. Hank was certainly that way too from the start. But it's also just his character. Dean is passive. He's growing up without control or context. I say follow your dreams. Even if they're about a giant spider with your father's head and he keeps stealing your penis. And of the two, he's the one Doc has effectively chosen to be a successor. Without even really considering what Dean wants, what it would mean to him or how it would damage him. Rusty despite all evidence, genuinely thinks Dean is suited to the role of boy adventurer in a way he wasn't. He also thinks Hank wants nothing to do with it, but Hank is kinda gonna be fine no matter what. Dean spends an entire season feeling tortured over the discovery he's a clone, but when Hank finds out, he just thinks it's cool. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of his sons, but that's just part of the Venture curse. Dean believes this crap. He should have been Rusty Venture, boy adventurer. Hank got this life thrown at him, and he fights against it. Just like I did. Since his father does nothing but project his own self-image onto him, that means unlike Hank with Brock, Dean doesn't really have a role model to speak of. Unless you count Giant Boy Detective. <laughs> but it also means that Dean can actually relate to his dad a little bit. Your dad may have been a worse father than you. Wait, I thought you said you missed the summit. I love you, Pop. It's an awkward thing to bond with his father over having the same weird fucked up life he inflicted on him. But that's kind of just how fathers and sons work in a certain way. The other side of all this is that it puts Hank in the position of basically being outright rejected by his father. Oh Hank. Sweet Hank. The Hank of my life. The only bad for me, besides the one from Fern Gully. He's all the joy left in this world and more. He's picked up the right lessons in every experience he was forced into, and also a bunch of quotes from shit he shouldn't know about. And they kill clean. Don't let Deems get in the way. Honestly, Hank, where do you pick that stuff up? I never see you read. And now he's clever, skilled, charming, and imaginative. He deserved better, is all I'll say. In spite of being saddled with everything that comes with the Venture name, he is truly his own Hank. You speak of the truth. Your words are a very Hank, my friend. On some level, behind all the bitterness and criticism, the show really loves its nerds. People who can get so deep into this stuff that they start to believe it really is magic. That it really imbues them with power. I think a lot of that comes from Doc Hammer. In Go Team Venture, he comes across as very attached to his dorks. Particularly Billy Quizboy in Henchman 21, whom he voices and often writes for. This is nuts! Like, half of it is written in Klingon, and the rest is Sindarin. Actually, that's Quenya, High Elven. Very similar to Sindarin. Billy Quizboy is probably this concept at its peak. He and his best friend slash albino permaleech Pete White are real, genuine failures. Billy and Pete don't have a trust fund and a compound to fall back on, so they're out here in a trailer in the desert pretending they're a real company. Billy is a brilliant surgeon, but no one actually wants to pay him to be a doctor, so it just results in him getting kidnapped over and over again to perform illegal super surgery. Okay, I'm just gonna get back in the bag and you can knock me out or whatever. I just wanna wake up in my own bed again. 
He has nothing in the world going for him besides his vast knowledge and love for pop culture. But somehow that's kind of enough, because it really is magic to him. Doc is the real Rusty Venture, and even though Billy can clearly see what he's become, he can also clearly see that Rusty is in there, the guy who really went on all those adventures and lived that life. Wow, you are back! Being Rusty Venture solving mystery! Being the king of the fanboys in a comic book world, Billy is truly at the bottom of the totem pole. But it also means he's surrounded by everything he ever thought was amazing about the world. No problem! We're super scientists! And we are living the dream! High five! Even if his villain is just Augustus St. Cloud, that's still a villain, which means Billy's an actual hero. It's really all a matter of perspective. Even if all this old, kitschy pop culture is outwardly meaningless, the feeling you get from it is real. It was the only real thing about it the whole time. Wait, it is magic. Why would you doubt that? It's the please, please tell me ball. It was all worth it. We saved the world. We did. Henchman 21 is very much the same. Doc Hammer said in the book that 21 and his arc is really what the Venture Brothers is all about, and I totally see it. Gary starts as half of the prototypical voiced by Doc and Jackson comedy duo that is Monarch Henchman 21 and 24. There are a lot of those in the show, more than I had even initially realized. There's 21 and 24, Billy and Pete, Watch and Ward, Red Mantle and Dragoon, Tim, Tom and Kevin, and looser ones like Hank and Dermot, The Monarch and Dr. Mrs. The Monarch, The Monarch and 21. Uh... Sky Pilot and Holy Diver. The only weapon you'll ever need, friend. Let's go. They have all the great conversations over meaningless pop culture bullshit that give this show its identity. Please, she'd be an asterisk 24 7 if she didn't weigh eggs. You pop a smurf has a fing beard. They're mammals. <laughs> Again, this whole show is a conversation. Both 21 and 24 in particular, it's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Foregrounded background characters who can't stop drawing attention to how meta the whole thing is. Yeah, you're the guy who doesn't come back. Yeah, some guy who just shows up that nobody's ever seen before. Right, he's all professional. Yeah, dude, you're a goner. They really begin to think that in this whole comic book slash Saturday morning cartoon world, they're kind of the main characters. However that happened, they're here now, playing those roles. Dude, we're like those guys on TV that never get shot. Yeah, we're like main characters. Don't jinx it. It's not like they're wrong either. This is a cartoon. They're getting stories and focus. But what they didn't pick up on is that this isn't a Saturday morning cartoon. This is the Venture Brothers and the Venture Brothers is going to treat you like this is real life. That means if you're running around bombs, mummies, acid, and lasers, unless you have a whole bunch of clones waiting to back you up, you're going to get yourself killed. 24! No! Ow! It really is a shame to break up a duo like 21 and 24, but it's also the best thing that could have ever happened for Gary's character. Again, the show isn't hurting for these duos, but it needed a Gary. After 24 dies, he starts carrying his spirit with him, initially literally, then figuratively. Come on! You help me all the time! Do I? Or do I just let you feel secure enough to trust your intuition? No! You are real! Losing 24's ghost is one of the most moving scenes in the show to me, personally. But 21 gets his shit together because of it. He goes bear mode, learns how to do his job really well, to the point that he can make a plan and put up a fight against Brock Samson of all people. Underneath it all, though, he never stops being a dork. He never stops making all these goony references and collecting all this crap. Uh, at least you don't look like Peter DeVries anymore. Who the hell is- Dude, Peter? boys! From one of you. Dude, dude, dude. His love never went away, he just started living in the real world too. It's a really beautiful thing, and he's rewarded for it. He started off as being valuable only for being somehow totally expendable and invincible in the eyes of his bosses, but he eventually becomes really respectable to them. In spite of being insane, the Monarch is like a father and role model to 21. He basically takes Dr. Mrs. the Monarch's seat next to the Monarch after she moves up in the guild, and he and the Monarch end the series as actual best friends. The team Monarch dynamic is pretty interesting in that way. Doctor used to be his girlfriend used to play the classic sitcom role of vastly more competent and intelligent than her husband character. So, all I gotta do is stay alive, and, and Rusty Venture is mine? Well, that's what it says. Dr. Venture is a guilt section Whoa! Finally! The show is definitely lacking for women, and I think it's a symptom of that that the most prominent woman in the show is being voiced by Doc Hammer talking like this. Oh yeah, that guy is totally straight. I saw a whole thing about him on the VH1. But he's the guy from Depeche Mode. It reads as a joke the first time you hear it, and was definitely intended as one, but you get used to it so fast. That's just her voice, there's nothing off about it. It is a shame that her role is mostly defined by her relationship with her husband, but for this series it does kind of work. Again, it's putting competent characters in a second fiddle position, and justifying it by saying that's just what they were meant to be doing. It's where they fit into the puzzle. In later seasons she gets promoted to Guild Top Brass, and she's great at it, but it also clearly shakes up the Monarch crew dynamic. Part of that is that she isn't working for him anymore, and part of it is being being so wrapped up in the bureaucracy of the whole thing. 
She and Top 10 Awesome Dickhead Phantom Lim, her ex, are effectively running the guild in the wake of the death of the Sovereign and the Council of Thirteen after Gargantua II. And that's hard on both her and the Monarch because, well, I guess we should just dive into him now. <laughs> the Monarch has been a guild villain since day one, but he's never really jibed with the whole guild thing in the first place. He's not a rules and paperwork guy, he's a die Dr. Venture kind of guy. He's got this unshakable grudge against a guy who, by all accounts, doesn't matter at all. He's both totally self-obsessed and rusty-obsessed, which may or may not be more or less the same thing. I'll say it. I'm pretty sure the monarch is a clone. When Ben is inspecting Dean in the episode where Dean discovers he's a clone, he checks for symptoms of cloning and lists them off in order. No acrofacial nasal dysostosis with comorbid idiopathic hirsutism in the orbital region, yet clear early stage androgenic alopecia. Poor little bastard. Uh, pupillary response good. The subject is free of any fetiform teratoma and appears to have normal heart and lung function. In effect, bald tumor eyebrows. It's all there. In the last episode of the show, we do learn the monarch is blood related to Dr. Venture. I mean, the simple answer is Jonas Sr. slept with the monarch's mother, so I guess Jonas is his dad. But that, uh, it don't taste quite right. It's a little too simple. It's a little too easy. Sometimes you get the simple answer, and sometimes you get Grover Cleveland's presidential time machine. So, it's fun to speculate and all, but I obviously can't make any definitive statements. At the very least, we all get to go, ooh, Doc and the Monarch with the real Venture Brothers the whole time. It all just fits. I love it. I live for it. Wow. All we really know is that somewhere in this whole mess of lore and history, the Monarch just started fucking despising Rusty beyond words. A grudge of truly mythic proportion. And that drives his life. It's too extreme a hatred to even be contained by the hero-villain system. Hatred's become a job. I had true hatred with Venture. I didn't have to fake it. That sweet loathing just poured out of me whenever I saw his pathetic face. In one of the best plot lines of the show, when the Monarch discovers his father was the Blue Morpho, a butterfly-themed Green Hornet-style vigilante and Team Venture ally, Ow, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm... he takes up the mantle alongside 21 as his Kato in order to murk every single villain who has arching rights to Dr. Venture ahead of him, all culminating in some of the best reveals the show has on tap. I'm so glad I was already a fan before the Morphic trilogy because I felt like we were just never gonna get answers to these things. And then BAM! Sharky's Machine. It shook me to my core. The Monarch's dad, the original Blue Morpho, was maybe the greatest victim of Jonas Sr.'s manipulation. He caught him making the biggest mistake of his life on tape and then blackmailed him into being used as a tool, handling the things Team Venture was too good to do themselves. I need you to seduce Dr. Z. He was maintaining the illusion, masking who Jonas Venture Sr. really was. And after he died, he left the Monarch insane and with a massive trust fund to blow through in pursuit of his grudge. He became another victim of the Venture philosophy, brought back to life as a cyborg to be used all over again. Billy. I'm going to need you to transplant my brain into Venturi. Wait, no, that's killing. I, I took a Hippocratic oath. I didn't. <laughs> So now the good guy is the bad guy, the bad guy is the vigilante, the vigilante is getting cucked, and none of it matters to the monarch himself because he just wants to act on his hatred. The monarch and Rusty are very similar in ways beyond their appearance or genes. Pretty much everything I listed that would make Rusty a great villain is also true of the monarch. I can't remember a day of my life that you didn't f up. Calm down. Look at all that history. We have so much in common. Oh, you don't know the half of it, buddy boy. What's that supposed to mean? He's bitter, passionate about his dumb toys, he's sitting on a fortune he didn't earn and still feels like he's owed something. Thing, it's all there. And both of them can, at the end of it all, kind of see through all the bullshit. They're putting up with the system and the paperwork because they have to, but that's not what it's about for them. I think that's why it kind of makes sense that the vastly more competent characters like Dr. and Mrs. the Monarch and Late Game 21 follow the Monarch in the first place. It's the fact that even though the Monarch isn't very good at this whole supervillain thing... It's classic Monarch look at my cool new thing approach. I got my money in acid or a magnet kind of thing. Ready the acid magnet! He goes too far and spends too much money, he breaks what he's not supposed to break and can't operate within the rules letting him do this stuff. Somehow, in one way or another, the monarch is maybe a genuine artist? Right? Like, sure, those two are good at it, but they don't give a shit about Dr. Venture. They give a shit about the monarch. There's a magnetic quality about a person who's really honestly fighting for something. It's a surprisingly hard thing to come by, that kind of passion. And naturally, it puts him at odds with the guild. I mean, why would you want to be a supervillain if you wanted to follow the rules? The whole supervillain deal is supposed to be rock and roll, isn't it? The Sovereign was fucking Bowie. I mean, he wasn't really Bowie, but he was Bowie. Red Mantle and Dragoon are maybe Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper. The guild started because Phantomus wanted to be in a band. It's rock and roll. It's the appeal of showing up with lights in a fog machine, throwing up the bird 
words and saying, fuck you, you can't tell me what to do. And maybe you're really good at playing rock and roll. Maybe you're good enough to build an industry from it, spawn a bunch of imitators. Maybe people get really good at selling tickets and making money. And there are a thousand people behind the scenes shuffling paperwork to sustain that. Maybe now you can do it as much as you want, but you find yourself asking what was the point of this. Maybe you have access to everything you thought you ever wanted, but you're finding it impossible to give a fuck. And then you see a psychopath in a butterfly costume who can't do anything right, but goddamn if he doesn't give a fuck. And then you become a henchman, I guess. I don't know, I lost track of this hypothetical. I guess that's why the stalemate by design in this show rings true. Even to me, some kind of internet anime guy. In a future where all media is fed through the Disney washing machine and stripped of all it's worth to be the most acceptable to the largest number of people, where culture and conversation are manipulated through flawless content algorithms serving growing numbers over the people that comprise them, I have to admit, I find a certain joy in failure, making jokes to make myself laugh, and no one else. Getting creator tips from YouTube and saying, no, I don't think I will grow my audience today. Sorry everybody, I'm just not a ladder climber. But I'm still here, aren't I? Talking about the Venture Brothers, because I love it. Because it means all this to me, and I've projected myself onto it this much. I guess I've failed as a YouTuber, but I'm still having fun just doing things my own way. The only way I ever will. Every now and then I have to remind myself I don't care for a reason. I just care. No matter how bad things are, that's the part that matters. That's why a show ostensibly about failure can still feel so uplifting. Because there's a passion underneath how awful and broken everything is. There's a real family in here, a real adoration for all this incredibly niche nerd crap. There's just love, and when you learn to love the things that suck, you can't really lose. In the venture spirit, I wanted to cut the brakes and close on a really sudden and awkward joke. But when I got to the end of Go Team Venture and read the afterword, I found myself pretty moved by it, and I'd rather share it with you. Not that I think Doc Hammer would necessarily want me sharing it, but bug you with my video. I hope you learned nothing from this book. It would murder my leathery black heart if I thought you got it. Your curiosity now satiated and the mystery dispelled, you move on. Fat with the feeling of being in the know. I wouldn't admit that you broke my heart. Were I to be questioned, I'd look away and tell you that I wasn't crying and that I had cat dander in my eye. But you'd know. You always do. How do I want you to feel? How do I want you to feel right as you're about to put this book away and notice that there's this little afterword at the back? I want you to feel like you found a box of love letters under the floorboards of your house. Like one of those plastic recipe boxes your grandmother had. You found this box and secreted it away to your room because you had the unreasonably high hopes that it had jewelry or pornography in it. There in your room, you open it up and it's just this meaty pile of love letters bound with an old yellow scrunchie. You look again to see if your door is locked before you begin to read them. Pulling off the hair tie, you notice that each missive is written in tiny, antiquated, florid script. Page after page of some love-drunk idiot pouring so much heart out. At first it feels alien and maybe a little intrusive to be a part of this fevered world of pitched woo. But with each successive letter, you begin to feel yourself a part of this love affair. Knowing that you will never quite understand the fever contained in its pages, it's a mirror of your fever. Yes, it feels strangely familiar. Then, in a sudden panic, you stop reading and drop the pages to the ground. You jump back as your heart races because the letters no longer feel like a revelation. They feel like memories. Did you write these letters? Were they written to you? This is insane. Who wrote these? Now in a frenzy, you look for a signature at the bottom of the page. Nothing. Only this phrase repeated at the end of every letter. I love you, Venture Brothers. That's how I want you to feel. Like you learned jack squat, but felt a part of our frenzied love for the Venture Brothers. Before you made the mistake of reading this book, you felt like you and you alone understood the Venture Brothers. You felt like the show was written for you. You were right. It was. Don't let this book tell you differently. Don't believe the lies. Forget the half-remembered anecdotes and cryptic scribbles. It's still your show. No one will ever understand it but you. You simply stumbled upon our love letters. Ignore me. I don't really have anything I'm comfortable adding to that, so instead I'll opt to repeat myself. The show was a gift. Thank you. Special thanks to my $15 and up patrons. Uh, the first one is just an empty ellipses. I think it used to be very Vino Vici. Uh, Afjo Zen, Alex Acosta, Alora, Ben and Cara Dowling, Benjamin, Christopher Rutledge, Color Crimson, Kraz, Danny Dalliance, Elroy, Francisco Medina, Gerald Walker, Gucci Lewis, Halleck, 
I love the federal government. Keith Catalano, Labo, Lotto, Luke Girard, Mimi Rutledge, Mountain Tim, Nathan Ratz, Nope, Rep, Armuda, Sam Nestor, Simply Aiden, The High Flying Ace, The Jarman, Toby, Tom Rutledge, Tyler Mezel, Tyler Wells, and Wackula the Masturbating Vampire. Meanwhile, 